Um, the first of our um, of our group is Adina Niazi, who's executive director and founder of the Afghan women's organization, Refugee and Immigrant Services. Uh, she's a highly sought after speaker and formerly a lecturer at Kabul University in Afghanistan. Um, Adina um, is uh, uh, also um, oversees the Afghan women's organizations as one of the few settlement agencies in Canada that are also a sponsorship agreement holder and has sponsored and successfully settled thousands of refugees. Thank you so much for joining, Adina. Oh, thank you, Jessica, for the kind of, uh, introduction. Um, and, oh, just before, I'm just going to go through the others as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, okay. Um, um, Babur uh, Mubarak is working as a settlement program manager with HMC Connections, and he has been working with HMC since 2006. Before immigrating to Canada, Babur was working with different United Nations offices, nonprofit, and humanitarian organizations. Um, and like many other newcomers, Babur recognizes the challenges of the settlement processes and has um, really been a tireless advocate for a welcoming community and uh, a smooth settlement process. <clears throat> um, and last but not least, we have Afat Ghassemi, who's the executive director at the Newcomer Center of Peel. And Afat is the executive director for the past two dec decades. Um, she's demonstrated determination and passion in creating a welcoming community in Mississauga in Peel. She has a master's in immigration and settlement studies at Ryerson and continued with a PhD in family relations and human development at the University of Guelph. So uh, welcome to all the speakers and I'll turn it to Adina now to uh, continue. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jessica. Again, good morning, everybody. And I, I really thank uh, PNSG for the invitation and for the opportunity. As an Afghan refugee myself, I want to thank my fellow service providers, the advocates, and the people of Canada for offering their compassionate, their moral, and material support to the newly Afghan refugees who have already arrived and those who are hopefully arriving on, the, on their ways. And so today we are asked to, the, to set a context about the Afghanistan, where the people are coming from, what is their history, culture, and tradition. Talking about the culture, I just uh, want to mention that the, the Afghans today culture is a culture of war, which is imposed by the nation of Afghanistan for the past 40 years. So we've been talking about the cultural aspects and tradition, what happened in the past and what's happening today. Uh, I'm joined with the uh, my colleague, Babur Mubarak. So this presentation, Babur and I, I will do jointly. And this is also a privilege uh, to be in the panel with Efat Qasimi, uh, who, uh, from whom I have learned a lot during our collaboration and working at Peel. Uh, so I'll pass it to Babur, and then we'll go on the actual presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Adina Jan, uh, I think for the nice word. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your time and interest to join us today. As Adina uh, was saying, it's a great uh, privilege and honor for me to be in a panel with such uh, dedicated, compassionate, and uh, experienced and expert Ifat uh, Qasimi uh, and Adina and Yazi. Uh, we would uh, have, I think, a presentation uh, very interactive. We have com uh, combined a couple of uh, videos. So most of your question might be answered when you uh, wait to the end of the presentation. At the end, uh, we will be more than willing, I think, to take your questions. Uh, so I'm, without further ado, I'm going to start. And please uh, keep your mic uh, muted so that we uh, do not uh, create any distraction. Thank you. The first uh, slide will have uh, Afghanistan national anthem just for information. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, did everybody hear the sound? The sound was okay, I believe. Yeah, yeah the sound uh, was good. Okay, thank you. In this presentation, uh, Dina John, I, we will be talking about Afghan history, culture, and society, social etiquette, and custom, and uh, some tips. And as uh, Adina, as John was saying, I think we are going to, uh, I mean, switch, and each one of us will uh, take a couple of slides. Uh, thank you. Uh, Afghanistan as, uh, as uh, located in the central uh, part of Asia. We have approximately uh, around 39 uh, million, I think, uh, population. It's exactly like a uh, uh, population of Canada. It's a uh, landlocked uh, country. Uh, uh, and we, uh, in Afghanistan, we speak more than 20 different languages, but the main uh, two official languages are uh, Dari and Pashto. Uh, we are uh, right from uh, right to left, and we have the same alphabet uh, like Arabic. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, Arabic or Urdu is not the language uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and Afghanistan has been a battlefield for global powers, but has never been uh, conquered. And it's uh, known as the graveyard of empires. The following video will give you a glimpse of Afghan history uh, in a, uh, I think, very colorful way. Uh, please stay tuned. Thank you. In the heart of Central Asia is an ancient land. For thousands of years, it was the hub of the Silk Road, the crossroads of ideas and trade between East and West, a marching ground for powerful empires. From Alexander the Great to Genghis Khan, Chinese pilgrim Zhuangzang described its fertile valleys and giant Buddha statues. Explorer Marco Polo wrote of a land rich with gold and gems, of objects that tell of great civilizations, and a kaleidoscope of people and cultures found here in Afghanistan. Over the past three decades, war and chaos have obscured Afghanistan's rich heritage, destroying an extraordinary cultural legacy. It's something that, that is really just terrible. If you feel that you've lost your culture, you've lost your heritage, it's almost irreparable. Afghanistan's great national treasures were nearly lost, but for a few courageous Afghans who risked their lives to safeguard one of the most important collections of the world's ancient history. A nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. Our people should know what happened. They should know about their culture, about their history. A history that is revealed in an unmissable exhibition. Afghanistan, hidden treasures from the National Museum, Kabul. Following a successful tour across the United States and Europe, from March 2013, at Melbourne Museum, Queensland Museum, the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and Western Australian Museum. Thank you. Adina John? Sorry, Babur, can you? Oh, okay. We were talking about the bar. Now it's gone. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Sorry for that. Uh, 
Adina Jan, we want to uh, start and for the slide, please. Sorry, I was muted. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So you saw you saw a part of Afghan history actually that the video was taped I think ten years back. Uh, but King Amun Law was the first the first king that declared Afghanistan as a monarchy, and he he was the king the king of Afghanistan at that time. The, I think there are still the bar there that's covering the full the, the thing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So during uh, came Amon uh, Lahan, actually, Afghans enjoyed the, the, the democracy and freedom. King Amon Law was is particularly interested in women and women's rights and women education. You can see, like, it, this, this picture is 100 years back, 90, more than 100. You can see, like, his uh, this is his wife, uh, Saraya, and Amon Law, and also that the queen. Next, please. Next. Okay. Yeah, and uh, for the first time in the history of Afghanistan, Amon Law sent the women, uh, young girls, to for uh, to obtain education overseas. You can see the, the pictures of the women who are sending. It. She actually he selected fifteen women to go for for other application. Uh, uh, to, uh, Turkey. Yeah, actually, my mother was also amongst them. My mother is the second one from the left. She was sitting also. She's one of those women who went abroad. Uh, but uh, he, sadly, uh, he was overthrown by uh, a fundamentalist. And there was chaos and um, uh, disturbance in Afghanistan for, for a short period. Then King Nader Shah, and after King Nader Shah, King Zahir Shah became the king. King Zahir Shah was the king of Afghanistan for 40 years. Next. Next. Okay. So uh, talking about King Zahir Shah, his, his period was the, called the golden period of Afghanistan. I think you have to go to back. You have, okay. Um, yeah. So when, if in talking <clears throat> in, uh, in talking about the Afghan culture, especially when we said the treatment of the women, Afghans are, have more uh, liberal perspective of women's rights than most of the people think. Uh, like back in 1880, uh, King Abdul Rahman, which was one of the, the Afghan kings, he advanced the women's right. He was talking about the women's right in Afghanistan. His wife uh, was called Bobojan. She, 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 she was not uh, covering her face and she was presenting him in, in the meetings. And, the, the, and, the, so, and also women have played crucial role, role in the Afghan history and society. And paying respect to women is very common and very special for the Afghan culture, especially for mothers and grandmothers. Uh, in the 1923, women were legally uh, granted freedom to, to choose their marriages. And in 1928, the, fir the first group of women, as I mentioned, was, had gone abroad for, or, for education, for, for their education. Next, please. Next. Oh. The, uh, and the constitution, uh, one constitution in 1963 during Zahir Shah, King, was, uh, the King had given the full right to the women. And so the women were holding position in the parliament. They were uh, in the cabinet. They were also cabinet members. They were professionals and lawyers and judges and university professors. Uh, so so uh, and many other professionals as well. Next. Uh, the Muhammad Zahir Shah was the last king of Afghanistan and, uh, in 1973. Uh, uh, he was overthrown by a, uh, through a coup which was led by his cousin Dawood. Dawood declared himself the, as the president of Afghanistan uh, and he joined Afghanistan to uh, <coughs> Republican. So that when we see here, like for the 45 years during Zahir Shah and Dawood, uh, Afghanistan lived in a peace in security for 45 years. And actually women enjoyed their full right. You can see here the picture of uh, the king with his uh, wife, with the, the queen, and also the, the other one is Dawood. Uh, I remember in 1970, 
eight, I was I was very young. I was just 23 or something. Please don't count my age. I was teaching at Kabul University. I, I dressed the same way. I mean, and majority of my students were men in the class. Almost 80 percent of women uh, of men were sitting in the class. I never felt any obstacle, or I never felt any barrier being a young woman standing in front of those men. So uh, th this was this was how women were treated up to 1978. Robert next. Robert next. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh... In 1978, uh, Dawood, uh, President Dawood was killed in a coup, uh, I think, uh, by pro-Russian party. And Afghanistan, I think, nine years just started, and it was lasted for a couple of decades. Uh, um, the uh, human rights was violated. There was sinless killing, brutal uh, torture, and illegal arrest uh, happened during that time. Uh, during the, uh, I mean, first six months, even my family experienced the same thing. Uh, one of my brother who was only 17 years old, uh, my elder brother, he was in grade 11. He dis disappeared like many thousand other Afghans. The only, I think, a crime that they did was just, they were eager to learn, they were educated and they want to contribute to the country. Mm, uh, the situation got tense. Uh, my mo parents didn't want to leave the country because uh, they were saying, if we leave the country, uh, um, our son, Timur, might come and knock on the door and he, no he may not be uh, able to find us. So uh, that time, uh, it was mandatory to join the army forces as it's now happening in Ukraine. Uh, anybody who was in grade 11 and grade 12, they had to join the army and without any delay, they would have been sent uh, to uh, the front line, uh, used as a human shield. I was lucky that I was able to escape. Uh, I had to walk for six days and six nights to get uh, to a safer place. And it was a narrow path surrounded by explosive mines. Uh, and uh, when I left uh, my parents, I was thinking that is the last uh, time that I see him because neither of us would have uh, thought that we will see each other uh, alive because the situation uh, Kabul, Afghanistan was getting worse and worse. And then, uh, uh, I mean, going through that uh, journey was not easy. I left only with one piece of cloth on my back. All uh, in my entire life, uh, I think, was left behind. Although I saved I think my life, but the trauma and uh, those uh, nightmares are still following me uh, at the moment. Uh, and then uh, uh, people against the uh, uh, government uh, pro-Russian, I think, start fighting. They were supported by Western countries. In 1998, uh, they, uh, my, I mean, they uh, created a situation that uh, Russia would draw their troops. And uh, the cost of victory was very high. Over 1.5 million Afghans uh, were uh, killed. Almost 5 million became refugees. And more than two, uh, one, or one and a half million people uh, became disabled. They have lost uh, their body part, limbs, arms, and, uh, and the infrastructure of the uh, country uh, was completely destroyed. The school were burned. Uh, teacher left the countries. Uh, and uh, there was more than 12 million landmines. I think uh, in the country and still in some remote part of Afghanistan, uh, many children are getting killed because those mines are still uh, there and uh, killing people uh, on a daily basis. Uh, after the 1992, uh, the regime collapsed and then those uh, people that they used to uh, fight against the Russian, they started fighting uh, uh, with each other. Uh, and then uh, it was a nightmare. Uh, Although I was able to come back to Afghanistan, because on, when I left Afghanistan, I finished my high school, I learned uh, uh, English, and then I uh, attended uh, a training in accounting, and I started uh, I've been working for the United Nations, but then the situation got tense again, the fighting started. Uh, we used to get more than 2,000 rockets shot on a daily basis, that it was impossible to survive. Some people even, they had to bury their loved ones inside the rooms because it was not safe to take them to a graveyard. Uh, and then the uh, majority of the Western countries, they turned back, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 their backs to Afghanistan and Afghanistan, uh, I mean, got, uh, I think again, in the uh, uh, conflict and uh, f fighting. Adina?
Oh, yeah, John, do you want to meet, uh, go ahead or you? Oh, sorry, I just give me to myself. Yeah, in September of 1996, the Taliban got the control of Afghanistan without any resistance, they entered Afghanistan. Actually, people I, I thought that the Taliban, there would be some peace and like, because they were fed up with the fighting of those friendships. But when Taliban went to Afghanistan, during the Taliban, the, the regime, the persecution and violation of human rights, especially women's rights, reached to its extreme. The Taliban, first they, they, they closed their schools for the girls. The girls were not allowed to go to schools and they did it under the name of Islam. Although in Islam, education is not only a right for men and women, it's an obligation. Even men and women are obtained to, uh, are, are, sorry, are obliged to obtain education. Uh, and also they stopped the women from working. Uh, next, please. And it was difficult. And it was difficult for many women who are the only breadwinners because we have many widows. Uh, so it, it made it very difficult. Uh, some of the women then started some underground schools for the girls and also some uh, intergender, uh, some, some uh, other projects uh, for women, for, for the other women. At that time, actually, our, our organization, our phenomenal organization, we, established, we also established some underground schools for the girls. I personally used to go to Afghanistan. I used to cover my face. I mean, to do the chadri go to, to this. Thing. So I could see the love for the education because the girls were coming to attend our schools. They were risking their lives. And, uh, and also the women who were organizing the classes the, for the teachers, it was it was very risky for them to do. So uh, the Taliban were also like uh, putting other restriction on men and on society and all. But after September 11 tragedy, uh, on the the America. Uh, uh, just announced a war against tourism in uh, October of 2001. So then America, with the uh, support of its alliance, started bomb bomb bombarding Afghanistan against the Taliban. The Taliban resisted furiously. So one of the justification for the Americans uh, bombing Afghanistan was to liberate the Afghan women from Taliban. Next, please. So here in this slide, you can see the women who are escaping the bombardments in the fight. And you can, if you could look at this pictures here deeply, you can see like the kids, the boy, how frightened this is the girls and the family carrying their kids, but still the kids are, are carrying their books. It shows their books, uh, their love to uh, education. You see the girl with the, in the pink and the other girl and the boy, they are having their books, they are carrying their books with their planning for their lives. Next, please. Uh, I think the next one is the video about the Afghanistan 60s. Uh, uh, basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so now we can see the Afghanistan's like the, the Afghan progress in the 60s and 70s, how it was yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. I think Afghanistan was not always, I think, uh, in conflict, as Adina John was saying, we had, I think, a golden time. Afghanistan was in peace at least for 45 years. Uh, and then during that time, I think uh, there was loss of development. And uh, when I was growing up, more than 60% of our teacher used to be women. And uh, Adina John was one of the professors in our Afghan university. So this video will depict some of those golden time.
because of the shortage of time, I cannot play the entire video. Uh, when you receive the PDF version, you will have the link and you can enjoy the entire video. When, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Taliban was defeated by Karzai, uh, despite continued security concern, war and a lack of unity, there were uh, positive changes, particularly for women. The school were reopened, women obtained higher education, and women uh, have been participating in public life, holding political office. Uh, the condition was changed to include a quota of parliament seats uh, for women. And unfortunately, again, I think in 2020, after 20 years, I think the deja vu just happened. Uh, those that uh, those countries that they used to fight against Taliban, they brought Taliban back to Afghanistan, and Afghan people again caught in this uh, turmoil again. Yes, like uh, today. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Please, please go ahead, uh, Okay. Yeah, and today we are back where we were two thousand. Uh, one. So again, again, the, the same dark days have come to Afghanistan. We will we'll, we'll try to we'll try to keep it open. We are trying to keep it as short as brief as possible because I know we have taken lots of time. Actually, uh, and also the United Nations says that, uh, says that Afghanistan is one of the uh, biggest, largest refugee. Is production uh, countries and refugees constitute the biggest refugee population of the world, uh, and also that is that this is uh, uh, the the hunger, the starvation, and that's the extreme in Afghanistan. So, the, um, uh, and also we have a large, uh, uh, very good, rich. Um, the history of the of culture of uh, art and uh, the, the Afghan jewelries are very famous. Go, go ahead, Robert John. Uh, I'm going to show you. I think a very quick video. I think that shows the beautiful dresses that are made uh, unmade by Afghan women and talented uh, uh, girls. <laughs> There is no end and beginning. Everybody is uh, at the same <laughs> Because of the time, I had to cut, and but then the link is provided. You can enjoy it later on. Uh, Afghan family is one of the most important unit, uh, I think, in Afghan society. So whatever is, I think, uh, a decision is going to be made, it has to be made for the entire family. So uh, uh, elderly are most respected. And uh, Afghan family, they live in extended family. So you might be working with a family of Afghan that they might have three generations living together. Yeah, and actually, Afghan hospitality is very famous in the world. Actually, uh, if you go to some Afghan place, no matter who is there, they are giving the best of their family to their guests. Uh, traditionally, when the traveler were traveling across Afghanistan, uh, and they would provide it with food and accommodation wherever they go without knowing who they are. But because of the war and the current situation, this tradition is now fading. Next. Uh, I think uh, it's always, I think, uh, I mean, respecting elders are very important. For example, we used to uh, stand up whenever the teacher was attending, uh, entering the class and your teacher was, uh, our teacher was our spiritual parents. Uh, so uh, as a courtesy, we case the right ends of uh, our elderies and uh, we place our uh, right hands on our hearts to show respect and uh, we, uh, Res, uh, respect each other. And then uh, one of the most common greeting is, I think, common in majority of the countries, uh, Salam or Salam Alaikum, which means uh, peace be upon you. And uh, in Afghanistan, uh, like many Eastern I mean, uh, languages, we have got the plural of uh, numbers and plural of respect. Uh, when we are, uh, I think, uh, addressing somebody elderly, we always, uh, I think, res uh, 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 address them, uh, uh, I think, as a shuma, uh, uh, which means, uh, I think, uh, sometimes it could be for two people. Uh, and uh, it's, 
it's in some, uh, uh, it's very rude, for example, in Afghan culture, like many other Eastern, uh, I think, uh, cultures, to show your feet, uh, I think, uh, uh, to somebody, you wink uh, at uh, opposite uh, gender, and as well, uh, thumbs up is unfortunately considered very rude in Afghan uh, culture. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, also beside beside that, the, the language and using the language also one of the but, and using John is very common with our ones. Like usually we don't we don't uh, for the elderly or people we are restricted we don't call them only the first only name. So for the woman it's John, and also for the men which uh, who are younger to you, you to us John is there. So you might hear John John. I, several times when Afghans are there, it's, it's, it's very common. Uh, and, and in terms of greeting, like usually a uh, woman has to, uh, to uh, give their hand first uh, when they're shaking hands. Uh, so, um, uh, I, so talking about your, uh, so there are some tips when you're working with the Afghans, like the, the, the people are, bring, uh, are really trusting the governmental organization. Sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, they may come, uh, sometimes they may come to you for minor questions so that, that, and if you do the explanation, that will give them a peace of mind because they trust you. Uh, some, uh, some of, uh, um, of some, they are not familiar with the comedian social structure, so it's better to explain for them about the society because different from Afghanistan. And they come to Canada with deep rooted traumas. They, they, they are still grieving with them, like with this extreme pain that they have gone through. So due to this ongoing trauma and pain, uh, they tend to forget things. So they might come uh, to you repeatedly and ask the same questions. So that's why um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it needs patience to keep repeating. And here you see that the year for when the Afghans are trying to leave Afghanistan and run for their lives. Next. The next slide is, I think, is, uh, I think a very short seconds of, I think, Afghans, uh, I think, uh, musical instrument that are originally created in Afghanistan. Uh, and it's organic music, I would say. Uh, I, again, I will repeat, I think the link is provided. Then after whenever we have a chance, you could uh, watch the entire clip later on. So most, yeah, most of the ones who come here, they have language barriers. Actually, the ones who came here, only one family member speaks English. So, and they will ask for interpreter. Please remember that Delhi is not exactly the same like Farsi. It's the dialect, the dialect of Farsi may be difficult for Afghans, especially for the Pashto speaking. So it's good to provide them with the interpreters. And also, they might discipline their kids in a different way like they did in, uh, back home. So it's good to explain to them the parental uh, and accept the parental uh, styles in Canada. They, they, most, uh, a majority of Afghan wants to work here as soon as they can. Please try to go find them a job uh, and also send them to the educational institution if they wanted to upgrade themselves. Um, because they are very passionate about uh, going to school and everything abroad. So they offer, uh, they might offer you small gifts. It's tradition. It's very common with the Afghans. So it's, don't take it as a bribe. So it's not a bribe. It's just out of respect and hospitality. Next. Yeah. Yeah. I've, yeah and please go ahead. Jones. Yeah. And, and also, uh, you please remember that when, when the Quran is reciting, don't uh, lower your voice. Uh, please lower your voice. Don't talk over the Quran because uh, this uh, as disrespect for their uh, holy book. Uh, and also that these religious objects like the beads in Quran is respected by Afghans. Uh, and also 
the uh, if they uh, they offer if you offer some uh, water or something it's just some hospitality and if they offer you all uh, uh, when you go and visit them it's, especially if you go with them, their home they might offer tea or water it's good to have a sip of that because it shows your respect to them next yeah, and what is prohibited in Afghanistan? Alcohol and drugs is prohibited um, for the Afghans. If they use it, then they do, but it's prohibited. A pork, ham, and bacon, they don't eat. Six, six outside of the barrage, uh, exposure, and uh, charging interest on their money. This is prohibited in the, in the religion and also in society. Next. We, we don't assume that when Afghans comes here, it's a beginning of their very happy life for them. Because uh, this is, uh, uh, please don't assume that because they have the trauma still with them. And don't assume that all the mental health illness and cases uh, will be uh, will be reported and also the cultural uh, uh, and also the cultural shock will be always reported. Especially with the mental health cases, it's a taboo in our communities. And also, don't overestimate violence, uh, violent expression with the, the, with the, the talk, especially with lang language, if, if they talk and like with, with their language, if they say, I'm so mad and I'll kill him, it doesn't mean. It's just sort of taking things out of their chest, but of course, to be careful, uh, what does the actually, the, the, what does it actually mean for them? Next. And the next one is, Alina Jana, is I think a poem uh, by an Afghan uh, refugee girl, because poetry is a very important part of Afghan culture. And I hope uh, this uh, poem will illustrate, I think, how Afghan refugees are, I think, crossing to uh, safety, and most of them, they cannot make it. If I were born in another land or zone, perhaps my name would have had a different tone. For instance, if I were born in London, they would have named me Jane or Jordan. My eyes would have been blue and my hair gold. My daily life stories would have been covered in media and bold. I would have only thought about Disney movies and brands, perhaps planning to spend my weekend in Wonderlands. My only worry would have been competing with my peer, but my bad destiny had a different turn and steer. I was born in the most dark and hopeless region, land of disturbances, riots, and baseless division. A place where kids used to breathe and see smoke and dynamite, playing with bombs and bullet shields day and night. Mornings, the sound of explosion would, was our wake-up call. Our sunsets were full of bombs, runs, and falls. We were born only to cry and to have tears. We become elderly in our teenage years. We die and finish in this world in search of peace. One can find our bodies in Europe jungles and fields piece by piece. To reach safety, we drown in oceans with lots of wish. Our bodies float the water as food for sharks and fish. Like a piece of ice, we are melting from the surface of this world. We are the unfortunate children of the third world. So, uh, since you're working, I think, with newcomers and immigrants, please don't feel sorry for uh, new refugees. Just believe in their resilience and as well their skills because they are, uh, uh, I mean, a human being like anybody else. They are the very difficult situation. It might take them a, a bit longer, I think, to catch up with the rest of the people. If they are being given the opportunity, they will do a fantastic job. Uh, to wrap up, uh, Afghanistan national are called Afghans. Please don't call them Afghani. It looks like if you call a Canadian a loony, uh, because the Afghan currency is called uh, uh, Afga uh, uh, Afghani. Uh, the official language of Dari and Pashto, uh, and uh, Afghan culture has been uh, persisted for over uh, three to four millennia, and family is the most important aspect of life in Afghanistan. And uh, Afghanistan is one of the countries that is still has one of the highest number of refugees in the world. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, we had to cut a lot because it was, uh, I mean, a limited time. Uh, if you have got questions, uh, we would love to, I think, answer it if there's time after, uh, if John is going to finish, or otherwise you could send us uh, the question through Jessica uh, and uh, Shiria. Thank you so much. And thank you for your attention.
Great. Thank you so much, Adina and Babur. That was so personal and um, so powerful to see and hear the um, breadth of the history and culture in Afghanistan. And um, maybe you can put your emails in the chat box as well. I'm going to turn it now to Afat to speak about um, her experience um, leading and serving within Newcomer Center Appeal uh, for the Afghans. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you, uh, Adina. Thank you, Babur. What an amazing, amazing, rich, colorful, beautiful story of Afghanistan. Although I know that many of your culture, because we are very, we are neighbors and, and we know each other so well in, you know, in history, but it was so uh, refreshing. And I thank you for that. Th that was amazing. Sometimes I wanted to cry, but I didn't. So because I wanted to, to <laughs> present. Now I'm taking all the audience from Afghanistan to Canada now. So what are we doing here? Um, so basically, um, so just give me one second. Uh, oh, wow. So it's gone to uh, here, okay. So I, I put my presentation names purposely as resettling Afghan migrants through the lens of humanized, humanization. Means that as Babur at the end said something very nicely that, you know, don't feel sorry. We are all human beings. It's just give them time and look through the lens, through the humanized lens and then help them. And then make sure that you know you are walking with them for the you know for the first year, second, and third, they will become part of this beautiful country, and 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 then help each other. So, just a quick um, um, history. Of, I'm I'm in Good. Canada right now, so don't go to Afghanistan because Babur and Good. how are you? And, and, um, um, and Adina um, said, said a lot nicely. So government of Canada just uh, promised uh, 40,000 refugees uh, from uh, Afghanistan to come to Canada. But do you know that we don't have, just, uh, just recently we, we looked at the, uh, the number. Um, so we have only 6,200 Afghan people arrived. And you know why? Because most of them are, are um, they stayed in Afghanistan, they couldn't come. Taliban didn't allow, um, you know, Canadian or any other countries uh, to uh, send the charter or, or a plane to bring them here. So the first uh, few days they, they, you know, they, they could have done it, but, but uh, now it's, uh, it's very hard. There is, a, there is an advocacy group that is working right now to push IRCC, uh, the federal government to provide one-time travel visa to ease the burden of getting passport from Taliban's officials because they need to do that. So, um, so this is the situation. And then I wanna say that, you know, you remember that uh, our policy, Canadian policy is very selective in Canada. So our government select who comes, how many people from where. So don't forget that. So um, again, um, just a few things, um, you know, government of Canada quickly uh, provided some uh, special, they, they call it a special immigration program for Afghans. The same things that they did it for Syrian and they, then now they, they introduce for Ukrainian. But um, it's a very special program under that, you know, government of Canada can bring um, um, our Afghan people to Canada to, to the safe haven. Um, so uh, these are the numbers, I'm not gonna go through it, but uh, um, I think uh, my colleagues told you um, uh, that how they, maybe maybe Jessica said, but how they come uh, either under the social, uh, special immigration program or uh, under humanitarian program. And uh, NCP, which is a newcomer center of my organization and Afghan, and, and Adina's uh, um, organization, we are, we are the um, uh, saw holder that we can, we can um, bring a privately sponsored refugee to Canada. So we're doing it, uh, you know, besides of the special uh, immigration program from the IRCC. So if there is five group of people in Canada, any, any, uh, anyone uh, wanted to put 
resources together and bring uh, families one to depends on the you know the, the resources uh, we can help the uh, the application so that's a good thing to do so uh, to in canada you can see uh, that the destination of Afghan people are various, you know, you can see that from the East Coast to, to the West Coast, uh, majority are in Toronto uh, GTA. And then if you look at the Vancouver, BC, they, they are there also, and also Ottawa. I think these are the most um, attracted uh, area of uh, uh, community. The reason, the reason people go this to, to this area because they're already community settled and they wanted to attach to their own community at the beginning. So they don't want to be alienated and, and then be, um, uh, be alone. Um, isolation is uh, adding another layer of trauma uh, to our, our Afghan people. So um, at the new uh, NCP is a newcomer centropy. So in our house, in our um, organization so far, I'm just giving you aggregated data from August 1st, 2021 to, uh, to April 2020. So definitely is more than this right now because now we are in May. So the number of clients we serve from Afghanistan is, uh, is 522 people. And then services that we provided to them um, is 2,260. I will explain to you what are the services. Um, but I just wanna say these numbers are absolutely correct because we have a system, we call it um, client management system, OCMS, uh, is created by OCASI. So we use that uh, system to put uh, our intake forms into it and then and then um, pr uh, produce all these uh, statistical reports. The number of families so far up to April, 108 families that we touched the lives of those people. So what are the age group? Uh, of course, they have lots of children. You know that that's, you can see the bar uh, from uh, zero to 14 years old. Uh, young people are here um, and also 15 to 24. Um, years old and most likely are between 25 to 44. There are, uh, there are seniors coming with them also, 65 and over. Uh, if you see unknown means they didn't write on their, um, on their intake form. We go to the languages, uh, of course, uh, Adina, uh, Adina and uh, Babu talked to you about the languages, main languages, but uh, those people on the intake form told us that most likely uh, they speak dairy, so you can see that uh, almost 68.5% uh, they speak dairy and um, almost 20% Pashto. They speak Farsi because they go to the neighboring, uh, neighboring countries, they learn the, the, the other languages and they, they speak Urdu and um, some of them, uh, they speak English very well and they're very educated. Uh, on, in terms of the uh, immigration class, so how did they come uh, to Canada and then arrive in Peel in Mississauga? Most likely is a government assisted refugee. We call them GARS uh, and it's very special program um, through IRCC. So 61% almost are uh, government assisted uh, refugee. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was really surprised that, you know, unknown is, is too high, 23, uh, 24%. But the reason I they they didn't they didn't put their own uh, you know uh, immigration class I don't know why so but we cannot change these things but privately sponsored refugee the one that we talked to uh, Adina's uh, organization and our organization we we sponsored privately um, almost uh, four percent of our uh, Afghan and uh, nationals are uh, coming uh, through the private sponsorship and family sponsorship. And then, then it goes to refugee claiming and others. So this, this page is very important. I, I'm gonna a little bit uh, explore, uh, and that's the data that we aggregated. So remember I said 2000 something services we provided. So these are the, 10, the top 10 services that they asked from us, from our um, amazing group in, you know, at the, um, at the um, you know uh, Salman departments in-house 
and Selman department outside in you know, schools um, and community connections. So they work very collaborative together and provide this. Let me just talk to you about education. Um, you know, um, I'm going to go a little bit, just a little bit deeper of my knowledge uh, and my narratives and and understanding um, children from uh, from Afghanistan, particularly girls, are um, behind. And as as you learn from uh, Adina and uh, Babur, uh, they they were just um, eliminated um, going to a school, so they were kept at home. So now they are here, um, and um, and they are far from, and they 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 age they. The, their age group are high, but uh, the level of education is very low. There is a problem right now here. Boys also, um, because they were working maybe, you know, with parents, with the father, um, there's, a, there's a gap. This is my, my, my real uh, issue. This is a gap in education for these, for these kids. We, as a community, we have to help them. We have to talk to the principal, vice principal, ESL, um, uh, counselors that bear with them. We are connected uh, so uh, deeply and closely with the TL, the TL Kennedy High Schools because there is a special class, 60 of them, sitting in this class. Just recently, we had a meeting with the principal and vice principal in our center that they are older, 18 years old to 21, um, and and they're so far, far behind of the educational system. So they're, they're catching up. It's very difficult for them. So um, we have to really bear with this kind of issues that don't think that they, they don't know or uh, they don't have cognitive uh, ability. They do, but the situation, the uh, uh, geopolitical situation didn't allow them. So, um, we talked about, uh, you know, we, we wanted to continue this conversation with, uh, with our educational system, our, our schools um, from kindergarten to, um, um, to high school, middle school and elementary um, to tell them these things that you have to really come up with a special programs and teachers should be trained. If the teachers are not trained, they don't understand them. So there should be lots of training for the for our teachers in order to understand these kids um, and their abilities and then move them forward. I want to show you something. Uh, I, I I believe in it. I, I study um, uh, through my uh, education. You know, um, there is a theory behind of um, um, you know acculturation. We call it acculturation theory. And that the person who is uh, the the the, uh, the historian and, and pro pro professor that they did this, uh, he's uh, Dr. John Barry, and he's Canadian. He's very famous around the world about this uh, this this theory that he brought to the attention of our um, you know newcomers and immigrants immigrants and integration. So he is saying that there are four. I'm I'm going very quickly to this to this. Um, um, for um, uh, theory, for theory, he says that if people come, you know, newcomers come to uh, to Canada. Either they assume they we want to assimilate them, or we want to integrate them, or they become separate from both culture, or they will be uh, marginalized. I will give you quick. Uh, what does it mean? If we say these people are assimilated means that uh, it looks like a melting pot. It looks like a United States. United States doesn't care about multiculturalism, but we have the act of multiculturalism. So we want not people to assimilate. We want them to be integrated. Integration means that you keep your own culture, but you try and learn the Canadian culture. This is the best theory that, in my opinion, uh, that Canada, Canada's policy in multiculturalism uh, introduced to all of us. But separation is, I want to I want to bring your attention to this. We, sh we should really be careful. Separation means you reject the host culture and preserve your own or your own culture. 
we have people here, Mennonites people, Amish people in, in Ontario, in St. Catherine, Waterloo region, London, Hamilton. We have those group of people that they just kept their own culture and they rejected you know, the, uh, the, the host culture. This is a little bit difficult and dangerous. So we, we, we don't, I think we should not, we, we should really work on this part. But the worst part that make us and make me worried and not going to, to, to tonight, to every night to sleep is um, the, the theory of marginalization. Marginalization means that when the when newcomers come and we don't pay attention to them and they just fail in the in, you know in the cracks. Nobody, nobody pay attention, no, nobody looked at them, say, you are good, you're good enough, you are you can do it, and and then reject then they will reject both culture. They don't like their culture because they hate it, because they came from war and that all these things happen to them. And then they, nobody pay attention to them. And guess what? Some radicalization with a group ideology or, or extremist will born, we were born from this, uh, this kind of ideology. This is the worst scenario and my worries and definitely all of us worries that we should not let our young people our group of people who are coming to Canada to get to this part. We have to pay attention and take care of them. Then I go to, uh, this is the, the education is my, uh, is my, uh, what is my bread. Actually, without education, I cannot survive. So that's why I pay attention to that. But source of information, they ask, health is most important because they cannot find um, doctors um, in, in Peel. Um, they come with the complicated issues. Um, so we should really pay attention to them in terms of the, you know, physical and mental. And um, Sorry, they ask I, money. Um, I just see we're at ten thirty now. Oh so. my goodness! I okay, know. so no, no. If we, if everybody wants to stay, um, just for another few minutes, we go, uh, we go finish it, um, or not, or not. I just stop it. That doesn't matter to me. Okay. Um, yeah, we can ask the group. Um, is uh, are some people interested in staying a few more minutes? Um, Afat just has a few more slides to go. Um, if people have to leave, we understand. Um, there was just so much information that was so valuable to share. So um, really appreciate it. So um, Afat, why don't you continue? And uh, those that sure. have to leave will sure. we'll have to continue on. So definitely, I'll go uh, rush to the. They need uh, uh, English classes. Uh, housing is important because they have a large, large families and, and, and one bedroom or two bedroom doesn't fit um, and employment and community transportation also. Okay, let's see what are the issues. There are two, two slides that are important. Uh, th those are issues that they told us. They said they are, uh, they wanted to bring their own family members, close family members, a sponsorship uh, is, is taking them you know, more than um, months uh, to just hear from IRCC. Uh, there's a delay of their payments and then child tax payments that is it bringing anxiety to them. Housing, I said that, you know, because they have a large family. Um, they cannot find family doctor. And uh, mental health, uh, we talked about it. Babura and uh, uh, Adinas talked about it. Um, link classes. Okay, this is something. If if we have people from uh, achieved uh, sitting here, uh, sitting around the table, uh, there is a huge uh, in-person uh, assessment um, um, wage list, and then we're sending them to Brampton or to Oakfield. So that's not good. We have to have them in in Mississauga. And this is so uh, new to me. They are particularly young people. They are rushed to settle, and they rush to get the uh, they get they get to to the job market. But they need a little bit patience and to 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 get acquainted to the to the employment culture of uh, Canadian cultures. So I think these are the uh, these are you don't need it because uh, Adina and uh, Babu talked about it. And uh, the only things I want to say that. There are most of most of the Afghan people. First, they go to the neighboring country. If you look at it, they move, they refuge to Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, 
and most likely they go to Pakistan and then they come to Canada. I think that's it. See how many minutes that I... <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's Asad, just the three minutes over. Yeah, I know uh, Newcomer Center of Appeal has um, served many and as you showed, and so we're really grateful to have your insights um, from you and the team. Um, so just to close, I wanna again thank Adina Babur Afat for such a wonderful opportunity to hear from their experiences, their expertise, and their knowledge. And uh, I really um, encourage Afat, if you wanna include your email in the chat box as well, um, and Adina, I, I believe you have as well, um, then that's a, a way that people can kind of reach out to you if they have any more questions. There was one question that will follow up um, with the speakers around um, sponsorship. So, and we'll share the recording as well as the slides. Uh, with everyone. Uh, uh, Shri has just put a survey monkey in the chat box um, for folks to fill out. We'll include that in the email as well. So thanks everyone for such strong interest and um, uh, we wish everyone the best in, in serving um, the Afghans who are arriving and it's an exciting time to um, be able to serve. So um, thank you again, Adina, Bobor and Afad.